let's focus for a moment on those images that have come in today that show the rover, the rover Pragyana in action. We put that out on our screens right now. The first video that ISRO has released that shows the rover actually getting down from the land of Vikram. There you have it. Coming down on a slope on the wheels and then going onto the surface of the moon. Let's explain that in greater detail by getting in experts on this broadcast. Joining us here is Dr. Amitabha Ghosh, NASA scientist. We also have Mr. Arvind Paranjape, who is, in fact, uh, the chief of the Nehru Planetarium in Mumbai. He's joining us from New Jersey this evening. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, to you first. Good evening. Uh, can you explain to us how really this rover works? Completely made in India, but importantly, there are about 27 mechanisms, which is what Isra has explained, 26 mechanisms, actually, that bring this rover together and has enabled it to actually move down on its own out of the uh, lander, out of Vikram and onto the surface of the moon. So once you land, what you do is you do a health check of the rover and the lander. You f see, you check out all the subsystems, the mobility subsystem, the communication subsystem. And if you find everything right, then you um, retract, the, you, you roll out the ramp. So the rolling out the ramp is kind of a non-reversible step in most cases. I don't know for ISRO, for NASA at least. So you have to be very careful that you're doing it right. And then um, you have to very carefully, you know, lower the rover. Just remember that if something happens while rolling out the, while the rover drives off the ramp, there is no way to correct it. There's no human being on the moon to fix it and, you know, bring it up or if it overturned to straighten it. So, um, so that is the process that you saw. And each of these processes are interrupted by um, data is being constantly beamed back and the, the controllers at ISRO are looking at it and then again, sending commands. So everything is done, being done incrementally. For the landing you saw, it was an automated, completely automated sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Here there is active interference. There's, there's a human in the loop, we call it. So. So, so that is what is happening. Interesting. And, you know, when I was speaking to uh, the former ISRO chief, to Mr. Sivan, he made a point about why the Chandra 3 cost is so less, because all of it is India-made, including the rover. Mr. Arvind Paranjpe, am I right in saying that every part of that rover has been made by our scientists, India-made? See, it's not just me. I think the scientific community as a whole, they're looking for yes, the distribution. Yes, that was to Mr. Paranjpe. Mr. Paranjpe? Um, Mr. Paranjapi, that question to... is to you. I'll come back to you, Dr. Gursh. Mr. Paranjapi, can you answer that particular question for us? Mr. Paranjapi, about uh, how, you know, this has been completely India-made? I think so, yes. It is completely made by Indian scientists, tested on Indian land, and made some, I, I suppose, uh, what I news I get is that they had made some um, uh, artificial surface to test out how it would move on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is an indigenous uh, buggy or rover, as we call it. But you know, let's talk about exploration. Dr. Ghosh, if I can bring you in now, uh, let's talk about really what we can see in the next 14 days. As someone who's a NASA scientist, and you've, of course, been a part of these kind of missions before, what's got you most excited about this particular mission, about what Chandrayaan-3 could perhaps find on the moon? See, it's not just me. I think the scientific community as a whole they're looking for the distribution and composition of the ice. Having said that, um, I don't know how far the craters are. Mm. Um, I don't know whether, even if they are close, whether there is a there is see there is a drivability issue. There are no roads on the moon, so you have to drive this rover very carefully through a tract of um, soil or regolith, uh, uh, which is which is non-hazardous. So so it has to be also drivable. So that is the single most, I think. But in general, you know, um, even if you got that analysis, that would not be the only analysis. I'm, there'll be NASA missions and there'll be other country missions, surely, to have data. It's a large, large region. You have to find out a lot of information. Um, but um, the other information would be the general um, geology of the area, um, the composition of the regolith, the composition of soils, if um, the composition of the rocks, if they analyze a rock with the alpha proton X-ray spectrometer, there's a variety of geological questions that are very interesting.
but you know, I, I again want to bring the focus back to that uh, video that ISRO has released today. You can't see enough of it, of the rover coming down onto the surface of the moon. If you can just play that, because my question next, Mr. Paranjape, uh, is about that particular footage. Uh, and when you see really the rover, Pragyan, coming out of lander Vikram and coming onto the surface of the moon, you see a heavy shadow on the lunar surface. Uh, is that normal? Is there like a spotlight there or is that how naturally the moon is lit up? Oh yeah, that is that 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 that, that is very clear that it, yeah. oh, it is in the south pole well? of the moon. Actually, the south pole of the moon was chosen for two reasons. One is that it is um, that part of the moon that is comparing between north and south pole of the moon. South pole is uh, towards the sun and therefore it gets it does get a lot of the moon. And also we have chosen the south pole of the moon because that's where um, water was discovered. So what shadow and light that we get, it's a perfectly normal. There is nothing wrong in it. In fact, this place will have now a shadow uh, sunlight for coming uh, 14 days or uh, say now the 12 days uh, where because you see the day total day on the moon is something like uh, 14 hours and the day and night put together it is something um, uh, 28 hours you know um, uh, that is a period uh, that is a lunar period that we know nakshatras etc so it's a 20 days plus certain time so this is perfectly normal. I don't see anything wrong. In fact, it's a beautiful images that I have seen uh, sent by my friends. Interesting. Like Mr. Paranjipe and Dr. Ghosh, request both of you to stay on with me. I want to focus on ISRO's announcement today. They've said that, look, Chandrayaan-3 is, yes, something we're focusing on, particularly in the next 14 days. But that doesn't mean they put pause or put a full stop on the other missions that they're working on. They've set their eyes on the next one, which is the Sun. Aditya L1 is the launch, in fact, is the mission that's going to be launched on September 2nd using a PSLV rocket. Now, this will be used to study the sun. It will be placed in a halo orbit around, uh, around what's referred to as the Lagrange Point 1, which our experts will explain for us in just a bit. This is in between the sun and the Earth, about 15 lakh kilometers away from Earth. It would take 127 days for the spacecraft to reach its destination. So this is way beyond how far Chandrayaan-3 has traveled. A satellite placed in such an orbit is a major advantage of continuously viewing the sun without any eclipse. This mission aims to provide a greater advantage of observing solar activities and its effect on space weather in real time. So there's a handout that ISRO gave today that explains the Aditya L1 mission and what really it aims to do. So let's explain that to you. According to them, the main objective is one is to study the upper atmospheric dynamics, which is also going to be very crucial to understand how really the sun influences weather patterns. Now, besides that, some of the other objectives are also of the Aditya L1 mission is the physics of solar corona and its heating mechanism. Now, remember that this satellite is going to be placed between the Earth and the sun. So it will constantly give you a feed essentially of how the sun works and the kind of heat waves that it produces. It understands the coronal mass ejection and the solar flares. I'm sure you've read up of solar flames, seen all of those viral videos of what it looks like and how mesmerizing it truly is. It also helps to understand the near earth space weather and how influenced it is really by the sun. So this is another mission, uh, another objective essentially that Aditya L1 will hope to accomplish. We'll study the dynamics of solar atmosphere, how it changes, what triggers it, what are essentially the biggest influences. Solar wind distribution, also another big aspect which goes around the entire sun. That also will be something that Aditya L1 will help to also break down. But as I said, this particular mission, if you look at Aditya L1, it's going to be traveling a lot further than Chandrayaan-3. And that's why, Dr. Ghosh, uh, if I can ask you, is this a lot more challenging? than the moon mission, the Aditya L1 mission? See, in a way, it is, there is no soft landing. So it, it is, um, it, it's, a, it's not as challenging. It's a simple, it's a, it's a launch, which ISRO, ISRO has done um, before. And so it is headed to a different part of the solar system. Um, um, so it, it's a very interesting mission, but you know, I think where the Chandrayaan-3 was very important is that it developed the capability. It was just not also about the um, about, about the specific mission. It meant, means that, that later 
um, ISRO could send another lander to Mars, to, to, to the moon, to the asteroid. So it's kind of the Chandrayaan-1 mission. Before that, India did not have a single orbiter. Once it had that, there was Chandrayaan-1, there was Mangalyaan-1. So while Aditya is very interesting, th this is a, a development of capability which is very significant. Mr. Uh, Paranjipe, what do you think are the big takeaways from this kind of a mission to the sun? What will ISRO be looking to achieve here? No, Aditya 1 is the uh, spacecraft which is play, which will be placed at the Langragian point as we know. You know, Langragian points are where the gravity of sun and earth uh, is equal. And it is made for observing the uh, observations of the sun. You see, sun is our nearest star. And by studying the sun, we can make models or astronomers have been making models about how other stars would be. So in that sense, it's a very much a technological mission as well as a, a solar scientific uh, mission. And therefore, uh, these two missions can't be compared. Um, uh, um, there will be one interesting factor is to take the spacecraft and put it at that um, uh, a Lagrangian point. And uh, that would be a, uh, that would be a, some kind of a small challenge, but uh, that challenge can be overcome by anyone without, uh, I, I'm sure ISRO will overcome the challenge and put the spacecraft. And by putting the space uh, satellite at Ad uh, Aditya one there, you can monitor the sun 24, uh, 24 hours, non-stop, continuously. Sun can be monitored, taken photographs and images sent back to India. It's a game changer, really, in studying the solar surface and studying the sun. The fact that it's going to be there right in the middle. What uh, uh, Mr. Paranjpe explained for us is it's between the Earth and the sun. L1, L2, L3 are different points. And this is right bang in the middle of the sun. Thanks very much, Mr. Paranjpe and Dr. Amitabha Ghosh for taking the time out and joining us here on India Today.